I'm Randy McConnick, and I thank you for joining today's 2021 Fall Conference presentation, Procurement Concepts and Best Practices. Our goal today is to one, help folks understand how to meet expectations, the expectations in state finance law and the procurement guidelines. We're gonna start broad and then get more specific. And two, we wanna build our relationships so if you need something, you feel comfortable reaching out, asking for assistance, and we'll do our best to point you in the right direction. If you don't know where to go, start with me, Randy McConnick. Call me, 518-486-1250. Me or someone on the team better equipped to answer your question, we'll, we will respond to you, we will. We're trying to start simple, and from that perspective, procurement is all about getting your program partners what they need to do their work. At its heart, procurement is about getting what you need at a price that's fair and reasonable. How do you do it? There are lots of ways, and we'll discuss some of them. And we know problems come up as you're doing your procurements, but when you're faced with a procurement decision, allow the principles of fair, open and transparent guide you. When you have to make a choice, if you choose the path that's fair to all participants, treating all the vendors the same, that's open and invites competition and participation, and that's transparent to all, you'll almost always be right. Let those values guide your decision-making, fair, open, and transparent. My broad recap, this is the prologue, You'll have success by understanding expectations and building relationships to help you meet those expectations. You already know me. Procurement is about getting the program what they need to do their work at a fair price. And if you allow the principles of fair, open, and transparent guide your decision making, then you'll be doing your work in the spirit that the state intends. Thanks again for joining us. Please welcome Ashley Markowski who will be your first presenter. Thank you. Thanks, Randy. Here's a list of our presenters for today. Joining me throughout the first part of the presentation is Christina Cresto. Thanks, Ashley. Good morning, everyone. For our presentation today, we'll start with an introduction to what our Bureau does and discuss an overview of procurement. Next, we will review several case studies with best practice examples and common pitfalls. Then we will go over what to submit in your procurement record. The mission of the Office of the State Comptroller's Bureau of Contracts is to provide an independent pre-review of contracts to achieve open, fair, and transparent procurements that produce contracts in the best interest of New York State. Our main goal is to carry out the Comptroller's contract approval responsibilities by providing professional services that are timely, judicious and responsive to our customers and stakeholders, and to communicate the results of our contract reviews to our customers, stakeholders, and the public. Let's begin by discussing the applicable laws that govern our review of the purchase of services and commodities for state agencies. We'll start with New York State Finance Law. Article 11 of State Finance Law governs the method and goals of New York State procurement. This section provides information on how to select a vendor and the requirements for both the state agency and the vendor. Next, Economic Development Law, Article 4C, defines the Procurement Opportunities Newsletter and the timeframes associated with advertisement. Note, there are separate procedures and guidelines for certain individual agencies including SUNY, CUNY, courts, and public authorities. These additional procedures are based on the above laws and should follow the spirit of state finance law, section 163, to ensure all procurements are conducted fairly and in a transparent way. In addition, OSC has published a set of guidelines known as the Guide to Financial Operations. Chapter 11, Procurement and Contract Management includes recommendations and general contract processing requirements for the submission of transactions to the state comptroller for approval. 
Another resource is the Procurement Council Guidelines housed on the OGS website. The procurement guidelines presented in this document are established by the State Procurement Council. These guidelines are designed to assist state agencies in making procurements efficiently and effectively by providing agency, program, and fiscal staff with a source of basic systematic guidance about state procurement policies and practices. Next, we will discuss the approval thresholds, which determine whether or not a contract is subject to OSC approval. Generally speaking, before any contract shall be executed or become effective, it shall first be approved by the comptroller when it exceeds $50,000 for any state agency, department, board, officer, commission, or institution. OSC shall have the pre-audit review authority of OGS contracts from its finance department and the business services center in excess of $85,000. Any contract involving consideration other than the payment of money, oftentimes referred to as a revenue contract, has an approval threshold of $25,000. This requirement extends to repayment agreements and other agreements, for example, barter agreements, where the consideration given by the state does not involve the transfer of money, but the reasonable value of such consideration over the entire term of the agreement exceeds $25,000. In circumstances where consideration flowing from the state cannot be readily determined in terms of current market value, it shall be valued in terms of intrinsic value. Intrinsic value measures an asset based on qualities in addition to its useful purpose, including both tangible and intangible factors. This value may or may not be the same as the current market value. Under a memorandum of understanding dated August 15, 2019, certain SUNY, CUNY, and OGS statewide agreements have an approval threshold of $250,000. Please see the OSC Guide to Financial Operations or the Division of the Budget Bulletin H1034 for covered contracts. After the transaction's threshold is established, agencies must then identify their specific needs and abide by relevant state requirements to meet their form, function, and utility. Once identified, the agency must then follow the order of purchasing priority when choosing the proper procurement vehicle. First, preferred sources. Second, OGS centralized contracts. Third, discretionary purchases. And fourth, open market procurements, for example, request for proposals and invitation for bids, which both result from a formal competitive bidding process. In the following slides, we will go over these types of procurement vehicles in the order shown here. Preferred sources come first in the order of purchasing priority. Section 162 of state finance law governs the use of preferred sources. When a commodity or service is available from a preferred source in the form, function, and utility required, the state agency must purchase that commodity or service from a preferred source. New York State has three preferred source vendors, Corecraft, New York State Preferred Source Program for People Who Are Blind, and the New York State Industries for the Disabled. All three vendors offer commodities, however, only the Industries for the Blind and the New York State Industries for the Disabled offer services. Commodities must be purchased from preferred sources in the following prioritized order. First, the Department of Correctional Services Correctional Industries Program. Second, approved charitable nonprofit making agencies for the blind. Third, equal priority to approved charitable nonprofit making agencies for the severely disabled. For services, if more than one preferred source meets the service requirements, cost shall be the determining factor in selecting among the qualified sources. Some examples of preferred source offerings include office supplies, classroom and educational furnishings, groundskeeping services, and janitorial services. For more information, please visit the OGS website, which has the preferred source guidelines and the list of preferred source offerings. OGS centralized contracts are second in the order of the purchasing priority after preferred sources. 
Per state finance law, all state agencies are required to purchase from the OGS centralized commodity contracts if the item is not available from a preferred source. For OGS centralized services and technology contracts, all state agencies are required to utilize these agreements except for state agencies where the head of the agency is not appointed by the governor. For agencies not subject to state finance law, OSC recommends reviewing your institution's purchasing guidelines. For OGS centralized commodity contracts, the clause OGS or less is often included. OGS or less refers to when an agency finds another vendor whose purchase price, including delivery, warranty, and other relevant terms offered by a non-contracted vendor is more beneficial than what is offered on the OGS centralized contract. In this scenario, the agency cannot solicit multiple offers from the same vendor and create a bidding war. The OGS centralized vendor must be allowed a minimum of two business days to match the lower price. If the centralized vendor can match the price, the agency is to follow its purchasing procedures and contract with this vendor. However, if the centralized vendor cannot match the pricing, the agency then has the op option to either conduct a discretionary or competitive procurement as applicable. There are currently over 1,000 OGS centralized agreements, also known as backdrop contracts. These backdrop contracts pre-qualify vendors, establish standard terms and conditions, set maximum not to exceed prices, and also satisfy many legal requirements associated with state procurements, such as advertising, vendor responsibility determination, and sales tax certification. While OSC approval is required for the backdrop contract, the individual purchases from state agencies, also known as mini bids, are not subject to OSC approval unless the outcome of such mini bids will result in rates, contract periods, or other objective provisions of the contract that are inconsistent with the centralized contract under which they were bid. Although the terms and conditions of the backdrop contract cannot be amended, through the mini bid process, both parties may agree to pricing or terms more favorable to New York State or the authorized user. For example, delivery terms, a longer warranty period, or no cost maintenance services. Under no circumstance can the authorized user and the contractor trade off terms for pricing. For example, the authorized user cannot agree to a waiver of contractor indemnity in exchange for better pricing. Some examples of OGS centralized contracts are for cars, building materials, bank card services, and elevator maintenance services. For more information, you can check out the OGS website, which has the list of the centralized contracts for commodities, technologies, and services. If a preferred source or OGS centralized contract does not meet the agency's need, a discretionary procurement could potentially be the next procurement vehicle option. Discretionary purchases are procurements made below statutorily established monetary levels and at the discretion of the agency. Although discretionary purchasing is not subject to the formal competitive procurement process requirements, it may require approval by OSC and or advertisement in the New York State Contract Reporter. The agency may pr proceed to exercise its discretionary purchasing authority only after it has verified that the discretionary purchasing method is appropriate. In an effort to be fully transparent, when making a discretionary purchase, an agency must ensure that the commodities and services acquired meet their form, function, and utility needs, including relevant state law and policy requirements, document and justify the selection of the vendor, document and justify the reasonableness of the price to be paid, buy from a responsible vendor, and comply with the agency's internal policies and procedures. Section 163.6 establishes a $500,000 threshold for purchases of commodities or services from certified minority or women-owned business enterprises, certified service-disabled veteran-owned businesses, New York State small businesses, and purchases of recycled or remanufactured commodities or technology.
If the previous procurement vehicles cannot meet the agency's need, an open market procurement should be conducted, which results from a formal competitive bidding process. One type of open market procurement is an invitation for bid or IFB. An IFB is the appropriate solicitation to be used when the method of award is to be based solely on the lowest price only among responsible and responsive offers. This procurement method must be used for commodities. An IFB describes the administrative process, defines specifications, establishes required delivery terms, bidder qualifications, the method of award, New York State terms and conditions, and provides instructions for responding. The nature of the product or service must be specifically defined and objectively rated. These specifications should also be precise enough so the agency will receive the commodity needed, yet broad enough to encourage competition. Another type of open market procurement is a request for proposals or RFP. A request for proposals is generally used for the procurement of services or technology in situations where price is not the sole determining factor and the award will be based on a combination of cost and technical factors or best value. Through its proposal, the bidder offers a solution to the objectives, problem, or need specified in the RFP and defines how it intends to meet or exceed the RFP requirements. Appropriate planning is essential for a successful RFP. The first step is to view the process as a project and to develop a timeline of events to meet the agency's programmatic needs and effectively budget staff time. It is also essential to focus on and develop the contract scope of service and deliverables that are required before proceeding to develop the methodology for evaluating proposals. In order to obtain best value, RFPs outline technical and cost requirements for vendors to respond to. They establish mandatory requirements that all vendors must meet, as well as technical criteria, which is the preferred or desired criteria that agencies are hoping to find. Additionally, the cost is factored into the score to determine the winning vendor, usually at a significantly lower weight than the technical criteria. RFPs must disclose at a minimum the relative importance and or weight of the cost versus technical score. For example, a common weighting included in RFPs is 75% technical versus 25% cost. In order to ensure a fair evaluation, the technical and cost evaluations must be conducted separately. The goal of a well-designed RFP is to provide the best value while promoting a fair, competitive, and transparent process. After the agency decides the appropriate procurement vehicle as previously discussed, there is a statutory obligation to advertise when there is a procurement opportunity where the contract exceeds the agency's advertising threshold. The intent of advertising is to promote competition. Per Article 4C of Economic Development Law, all procurements by state agencies greater than or equal to 50,000 shall be advertised in the state's Procurement Opportunities Newsletter. The newsletter, titled the New York State Contract Reporter, is intended to ensure the integrity of the state procurement process by providing for regular centralized public notice of state agency and public authority intentions to contract for goods and services. A minimum of 15 business days must elapse between publication of the notice and the date on which a bid or proposal is due, except where a shorter period is authorized by law. For solicitations with pre-bid conferences, walkthroughs, and question and answer periods, OSC recommends agencies consider posting the advertisement for a longer period of time. For a circumstance or situation that would render notice in the contract reporter to not be feasible, an agency can submit a contract reporter exemption request to OSC. This approach should only be utilized when it can be demonstrated and documented that to provide notice in the contract reporter cannot be undertaken or would serve no useful purpose. For example, 
some types of CRERs are single and sole source procurements and emergencies. For urgent and unexpected situations where health and public safety or the conservation of public resources is at risk and advertising requirements cannot be met, agencies can set up emergency contracts. For emergency contracts, an agency may issue procurements without complying with formal competitive bidding requirements. In these scenarios, however, an agency should make a reasonable attempt to obtain at least three oral quotes. Please note if an agency's failure to properly plan in advance, which then results in a situation where normal practices cannot be followed, does not constitute an emergency. OSC approval must be obtained for an emergency contract if the contract's value is over the state finance law section 112 discretionary threshold. In addition, if the agency is seeking a waiver from advertising in the New York State contract reporter, OSC must approve the exemption. Another type of procurement vehicle that does not follow a formal competitive bidding process is piggyback contracts. At times, an agency may find it more efficient to establish a contract based on another governmental entity's agreement. The product or service sought must be comparable to the original contract and should reflect your agency's form function and utility needs. In addition, the size and scope of the new acquisition should be evaluated to ensure the proposed piggyback agreement will not significantly unbalance the original scope or change the nature of the original contract. Additional approvals are also required from OGS, the originating agency, and the vendor. Notifying OGS of the piggyback agreement can even help set up the development of new centralized contracts. OSC also recommends the agency consider negotiating with the vendor for an additional discount. For example, if the volume has significantly increased, a vendor may now be able to offer a lower per unit price. For more information, agencies can view the criteria established by OGS in its guide for piggybacking. This concludes our section on the overview of procurements. Next up, Priscilla Matias will discuss estimated usage and best price procurements. Thank you both Ashley and Christina for that informative or overview. Now on to estimated usage and best price procurements. The law says a description of the required specifications governing performance and related factors in its need for a balanced and fair method of award. How do we achieve these goals towards a balanced and fair method of award? By including specific quantities or providing accurate estimated usage in the solicitation document to ensure the vendor has a clear understanding of the agency's needs and the agency is getting fair pricing for what is actually needed. What is estimated usage? Estimates are an approximation provided by the agency and are typically based on historical usage or estimated need for a particular commodity or service. It is up to the agency to determine their needs for the, that particular item or service. These estimates should be accurate. Overestimating needs could result in harming the vendor. Underestimating needs could result in the agency not being able to get what you need and potentially paying too much for it. Providing accurate estimates ensures better pricing and gives the potential bidder reasonable expectations regarding the scope of work. When the estimates provided are accurate, the bidder can provide competitive pricing and may even offer discounted rates for items purchased in bulk numbers. It also allows the vendor to plan accordingly to ensure their business has the capability to provide the services or commodities sought. Maybe the vendor could give you a great price if they knew what your actual needs are. Would you call Mavis Tire Discount for a quote for 16 winter tires for your car? Most likely you would only need four tires, so you would want to get pricing for the four, not 16. Estimated usage or estimated quantities and procurements are made a part of the bid specifications and are required in IFBs. The way we see estimates in a procurement would be through providing an estimated numbers of hours to complete a specific task or a specific quantity of items needed for a particular order 
or the square footage of a room that needs to be painted or the number of coats of paint. Unintended consequences. When the agency does not provide accurate estimates, overestimates or underestimates its need for a particular item or service, it can result in unintended consequences for the agency, but also the vendor. For services, a vendor may seek to hire sufficient staff to handle the agency's estimated service. If the actual need is much lower, new staff may be laid off. For commodities, a vendor may purchase additional inventory to meet agency need. If the need is substantially less than solicited, the vendor may face financial loss. How do we ensure estimates are accurate, fair, and are a true representation of the agency's needs? Through bid specifications. In developing the bid specs, the agency assesses their needs, collaborates with program, review historical costs and actual spending, establishes mandatory bidder qualifications, decides how each requirement will be measured, and encourages competition. Stay away from restrictive bid specifications. Define what you need by how it functions, not by how many inches it is wide, unless that is a requirement. If there is a 53 inch space the washing machine must fit in, that requirement might make sense. Including that requirement when the space is not a factor could significantly limit the competition as only one or two vendors may offer that specific size. Give potential bidders an estimate of how many and how much, but do not guarantee a minimum purchase amount. There are economies of scale, and if the vendor realizes your average spending estimate is quite large or quite regular, or that you require monthly instead of daily shipments, this may affect the price to the agency's advantage. Be sure to add language to the solicitation document that states that you are not guaranteeing any minimum amount. Next, we will look at a couple of case studies. We recently reviewed a purchase authorization for a commodity purchase with an estimated value of 1 million. The agency provided the estimated quantities they needed on the bid form for the vendor to bid their best price. Since the competition was limited, we looked at prior contract usage and noted the contract was significantly underspent and the agency increased its usage. We followed up for support for the increased usage. Why do you need more if you didn't use all of what you had before? Unable to document support for the increased quantities, the agency agreed to reissue the procurement using estimated quantities more consistent with their anticipated usage. The main takeaway here is the cost evaluation methodology should have a reasonable relationship to the anticipated costs. While they do not need to exactly mirror historic usage, such quantities must have a reasonable relationship to historic use and should estimate future needs. Another transaction reviewed recently was for interior painting services. The scope had a general description of work and included a mandatory site visit. The bid form had the bidder's bid, the hourly rate, anticipated hours, required gallons, and an estimated value of materials needed to complete the project. The agency did not specify the square footage of each room or the steps of work involved to complete the project. The bids received were all over the place and inconsistent in every item bid, as demonstrated on this slide. Bidder A bid $140 per hour with 800 hours and estimated 250 gallons of paint would be needed whereas bidder C anticipated it would only take 137 hours, bid an hour, hourly rate of $516, and estimated 16 gallons of paint would be needed. The inconsistency in bids suggests the bidder did not understand the scope. Even with the site visit, they all saw something different in terms of work to be done, which is why specifications in the bid forms are so important. It was evident the specifications were not made clear. The agency agreed to reissue the procurement with clarified specs and revise the bid form. The bid form is key to accurately demonstrating the agency's need to the bidder, what is being sought by the agency and how the bid amount is calculated. Before you release something, 
Make sure all the bidders can follow the instructions and know what's needed. Developing clear bid specifications, listing them clearly in the solicitation document, outlining each item and quantity or hours of services needed in the bid form ensures that the bidder will have a clear understanding of what is needed and how to compute their bid and bid amounts. As we can see, accurate estimated usage is critical to obtaining competitive pricing in the procurement process. Overestimation and underestimation can result in unintended consequences for both the agency and the bidding community as vendors expect the agency's stated need will be rational and reasonable. Specifications and accurate estimated usage are critical to ensure all bidders have a clear, uniform understanding of the scope and requirements. This ensures fair competitive pricing and broaders the vendor pool for contracting with state agencies. Next up, we have Amanda Cullum here to discuss shortlisting. Thanks, Priscilla, and good morning, everyone else. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm going to be discussing shortlisting today. So what is shortlisting? Essentially, you are taking the list of qualified bidders and making the list shorter by predefining who is susceptible to award. In RFPs, shortlisting is often used to eliminate vendors who are not susceptible to award before moving on to a presentation or demonstration stage. What is being susceptible to award? Well, being susceptible to award means that any vendor who could possibly be awarded the contract will move into the next stage in the evaluation process. When agencies decide to procure utilizing a shortlisting method, they must calculate using the technical and cost scoring. This is to ensure that state finance law is being adhered to and best value is being achieved. As previously stated, all vendors susceptible to award must be considered after the initial technical and cost scores have been calculated. It is best practice to only use this technique if the agency determines it is absolutely necessary in order for the procurement to retrieve best value. It is important to predefine who will be considered susceptible to award in the RFP and evaluation documents. Be prepared to justify your decision as agencies may be asked to explain how they decided what vendors would be shortlisted. An example of language seen in RFPs is, if the oral presentation is worth 10 points, anyone within 10 points from the highest scoring vendor is susceptible to award and must be shortlisted. I would like to point out that any oral presentations, demonstrations, or interviews that are anticipated need to also be predefined in the RFP documents and must fit into the evaluation calculation based on the maximum points available. Shortlisting is something that the agency can consider if there is an overwhelming response to the solicitation. Another reason an agency might use shortlisting as a tool is to limit the number of vendors to be evaluated in the event of a multi-phase evaluation, such as interviews or demonstrations. Agencies need to be careful when choosing to use shortlisting as a tool because awards can be overturned if not all vendors are interviewed that are susceptible for an award. Okay, so now we are going to go through a case study to better explain and visually show you a scenario with some important, with some improvement opportunities. I will explain what is flawed about the example in hopes to help limit any chance for protest in future procurements. So case study number one. As you can see, the overall 100% RFP evaluation, of the 100% evaluation, the technical proposal will be worth a total of 70%, the cost score will be worth 20%, and the oral presentation will be worth 10%. The RFP 
P predefined that shortlisting would occur after the initial composite scores were calculated. The agency has determined that only one award will be made under this contract. So as you can see here, there were six bidders involved with the initial cost and technical evaluation. The proposal stated that the highest composite score and the next three highest scoring proposals, if they are all within 10 points of the highest total score, will be shortlisted and invited for an oral presentation. The preliminary scores revealed that vendor D has the highest composite score. I'm gonna give you guys a minute to review the table and consider who will be shortlisted based on this RFP language. All right, time's up. <laughs> so as previously stated, the highest scoring vendor was vendor D. And the next three highest scoring vendors were vendors B, E, and F, as shown in the second table. These vendors have been shortlisted per the RFP language and will be moving on to the oral presentation evaluation portion of the procurement. However, they are not the only vendors who appear to be susceptible to award. Please keep in mind that the oral presentation is worth a total of 10 points. So with the RFP written to only include the next three vendors within 10 points from the highest scoring vendor, this resulted in the agency awarding a contract to vendor D. Unfortunately, this is not the vendor who should have been awarded the contract, and this could result in a fatally flawed procurement. Fatally flawed means a procurement that cannot be fixed and would need to be re-procured, which nobody wants. So let's discuss how we ended up here and what we can do to prevent this. Let's go back to the original preliminary scores in the first table before the shortlisting occurred. With the oral presentation being worth 10 points and the highest composite score being vendor D with 75.7 points means that any vendors who are susceptible to award are all vendors that can meet or exceed vendor D's score after the oral presentation. Hypothetically, this is because if vendor D receives zero points for their oral presentation, then the other five vendors could be susceptible to award because they could potentially receive 10 points for their presentation. So going back to the RFP language, the agency limited the number of vendors who will move into the oral presentation by specifying the highest composite score and the next three highest scoring proposals. This did not allow for all vendors who were susceptible for award to move into the next phase of the evaluation. Although the agency laid out the process in the RFP, they did not give every vendor who could have potentially won an opportunity to be interviewed. The second table shows the correct way that the shortlisting should have been evaluated and calculated. By adding the maximum number of points that a vendor can receive in the oral presentation evaluation, it shows that four vendors could meet or exceed vendor D's score of 75.7 and have a chance to be awarded the contract. Vendor C is the only vendor who is not susceptible to award and would not be eligible to give the oral presentation. So if the, RF, if the original RFP language said, all vendors susceptible to award based on composite score will be invited to the oral presentation, then any vendor who could have had a chance to be awarded the contract would have been fairly given the opportunity. So thank you everyone. And up next is Matt Miraboli to discuss best and final offers. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Amanda. My name is Matt Miraboli. And now that we have covered shortlisting, we are gonna look at a topic that does sort of tie in and that is best and final offer. 
which I am also going to be referring to interchangeably throughout the presentation as BAFO. Now, should you decide to venture down the BAFO road, you should know some agencies do request BAFOs from procurements that were shortlisted. However, many of those transactions did not go as planned and in many cases resulted in no award. With that being said, the point of this presentation is really to show you the potential pitfalls of this process. This next slide is just an excerpt from state law, which specifically is dealing with best and final offer. Uh, Amanda just described for us the shortlisting process. Well, like a shortlist, a BAFO applies to offers susceptible of being selected for contract award. A BAFO is really a revised cost proposal, but it has to meet these key points. First, like most things we do here, we want to make sure it's in the best interest of the state. The state shouldn't be giving anything up as a result of the BAFO. It should be the same work, just at a lower price. Next, your specs really should not be changing as a result of the BAFO. Cost is what would potentially be changing. Your specs shouldn't be. Third, everyone proposed a revised cost in the same way. The reason being, so it's fair and equitable to everyone who gets the option. Because in order to be fair, everyone has to be treated the same. And last, can you offer a BAFO to a bidder not susceptible of award? Well, thanks to Amanda, you now know how to shortlist, right? The answer to my question would be no. It only goes to offers susceptible of being selected for contract award. Now, people often confuse BAFO with negotiations. They are different. BAFO, the process needs to be well-defined in the solicitation. The opportunity needs to be presented to all responsive, responsible offers, and the process needs to be defined prior and award made prior. BAFO should be amongst the offers who are, again, susceptible of award, not negotiating with the apparent awardee. On the other hand, a negotiation is something that you can always negotiate a lower price with the awarded bidder, but that comes after you've made the selection. Negotiation is simply asking for a better price with the awarded vendor after the award has been made and after the vendor has been selected. Again, not changing terms, not changing conditions, just negotiating a lower price with the best value slash best price awardee. Some BAFO best practices. Well, there should be at least two offers susceptible of being selected for contract award. If any optional components exist as part of the procurement, the offers should provide a proposal for all options. This is to ensure fairness. In other words, Everyone is offering revised pricing on the same thing based on the same scope. Last, it should be a conscious agency decision to use a BAFO. For example, uh, it's being used because the agency determined it will maximize the ability to obtain best value. So in general, the concept is you're down to more than one person who has offered a viable solution their combined technical and cost proposals are in essence equal. And at this point, you're going to take the offer that is the best cost. Now that we've laid some groundwork for BAFO and have a basic understanding, let's take a look at a simulated example. Here, Agency X is seeking to procure a new computer system. Because this is a highly competitive field, the agency does anticipate many proposers. After careful consideration, the agency decides to include a BAFO as it will be in the state's best interest and will ultimately maximize best value. 
So, as I said in an earlier slide, the BAFO process needs to be laid out in advance and well defined in the solicitation. Here we can see Agency X established their evaluation scoring criteria as follows technical being worth 60%, cost being worth 30%, and then the demonstration being worth 10%. The vendor must be within 10 points of the highest composite score to qualify for the opportunity to provide a demonstration. I wanna point out that this is very similar, again, to what Amanda just mentioned about all vendors who are susceptible to award are invited to participate in the demonstration. Following the interview, here's the trick. How do we figure out who is substantially equivalent and gets offered the BAFO opportunity? Well, in this imaginary example, the agency predetermined any vendors remaining that are within 5% of the highest composite score, including system demonstration, will be deemed substantially equivalent and asked to submit a best and final offer where the lowest cost will determine the award. Now, it's important for me to mention that this is just for demonstration purposes and the values that we're using here are just for example. Ultimately, you, the agency, are gonna determine what are the correct values for your procurement, just as you're gonna to have to determine and decide what is substantially equivalent ahead of time. In a lot of ways, essentially, we are creating a manufactured tie. We take a look now at our, our score matrix summary. In the leftmost row, we've got our vendors listed A through H. And then from left to right, we've got our scoring categories and our um, scoring totals. So if you look at the five vendors there highlighted in yellow, with 10 points of the highest score. They are vendors B, D, E, G, and H, who are qualified to participate in the system demonstration, bringing us ultimately to the final composite shortlist for remaining vendors who are within 5% of the highest composite score, which are our vendors D and E, ultimately with our best final offer coming from vendor D. Now, in our imaginary example, if a final composite score of 84.5 were to come in, it wouldn't qualify, right? Because it's 5%, not five points. And you remember that is how Agency X predefined what is substantially equivalent. So when vendor H protests, is it fair? Can you document this was your plan? And say, yes, it is fair. The vendor H didn't get an opportunity to offer a lower price. Again, you have to think, do you really want to open this door? A reasonable person might say, well, what's the difference between 84 and 85? But that's not the law, right? It needs to be predetermined. Should someone challenge the process, can you show it was fair and can you show it was in the best interest of the state? In wrapping up things for BAFO, what are some important considerations when contemplating this procurement technique? Well, is it really best value? How will substantially equivalent be determined is it fair and an, is it an open, transparent process? Does this approach fit the service or does it overcomplicate things? Would a negotiated contract be a better option? Here's a question though that is impossible to answer. If you reserve the right for a BAFO and don't use it, are you sure you're getting the best price? Or are you leaving money on the table by including the option of a BAFO, but not actually going through with it? How do you know the vendor gave you their best price? There is really not a way to answer that question, and you better believe that OSC is going to ask you that question. Finally, as always, 
if you're con contemplating a BAFO, consult with your legal counsel just to make sure it is the right decision. With that being said, should you choose to utilize a BAFO and fail to execute it with the utmost precision, you may find yourself caught up in our next topic, which is debriefing and protest presented to us today by Jennifer Wade. Thank you, Matt, and good morning, everyone. Our next topic of discussion will be debriefing and protest. What is a debriefing or a protest? What can be discussed during a debriefing? Where on the New York State Office of the State Comptroller's Guide to Financial Operations can information be found regarding debriefing and protest? What information should be included in your procurement package to OSC regarding each? And how does this relate to the submission of a full procurement record to the Office of the State Comptroller? All of these questions will be answered during our presentation today. Debriefings and protest procedures should be outlined in the state agency solicitation documents. The solicitation document must identify the state agency protest procedures. The solicitation document and non-award letters must identify that any non-successful bidder has an opportunity to request a debriefing. Per state finance law, section 163-9C, when a responsible and responsive bidder successfully wins an award, the state agency must notify all bidders via an award letter or non-award letter of the outcome of their bid. Upon the release date of a non-award letter, any non-successful bidder must have the opportunity to request a debriefing. The non-successful bidder is required 15 calendar days to request a debriefing from the state agency regarding their non-successful bid. The 15 calendar day period begins upon the release date of the non-award letter to the non-successful bidder. All debriefings should be conducted by the state agency in person. However, the parties may mutually agree to utilize other means. Debriefings may be conducted via telephone, video conferencing, or other types of electronic communication as mutually agreed upon by the state agency and the vendor. State agency personnel who were involved in the procurement and are knowledgeable with the bidder selection should be the personnel conducting the debriefing with each vendor who requests one. This will allow the agency to provide the most valuable feedback to the non-successful bidder. The state agency shall schedule the debriefing to occur within a reasonable amount of time upon receiving a request for a debriefing from any non-successful bidder. During a scheduled debriefing, discussion of only the non-successful bidder submission should be discussed. A debriefing provides a non-successful bidder an opportunity to understand and gain knowledge of the proposal's requirements that will allow for a successful, responsive, and responsible bid in the future. What items can be discussed during the debriefing? Discussion during a debriefing shall include, but are not limited to the following. The reason the proposal or bid was not selected for an award, the qualitative and quantitative analysis performed by the agency when assessing the relative merits of the proposal or bid, the application of the selection of criteria and how the non-successful bidder's proposal scores, how did the vendor score compared to other bidders? The reason or reasons the selection of the winning proposal or bid without discussing the details of the winning bid. General advice and guidance to the unsuccessful bidder concerning potential ways future proposals or bids could be more responsive. Was there an area of the proposal that the bidder could be providing more in-depth information that would allow them to gain knowledge of the proposal's requirements established by the state agency and assist them with their next bid submission? For example, more detail rather than brief information regarding the services that the vendor can provide. 
All items that are discussed during the debriefing must be documented in detail for the procurement record and uploaded with the procurement documents for submission to the Office of the State Comptroller. Now let's continue our discussion with protests. Detailed protest procedures and information for state agencies can be referenced and found on the New York State Guide to Financial Operations website under Contracts Chapter 11, Procurement and Contract Management, Section 17, Protest Procedures. Furthermore, OSC bid protest procedures can be found in Title II, Chapter 1, Part 24 of the New York Code's Rules and Regulations. This summarizes the Office of the Stomp State Comptroller's Contract Award Protest Procedures and would be used when interested parties emphasize to OSC that the State Comptroller should not approve a contract award by a public contracting entity or state agency. What is a protest? A protest provides an opportunity for an interested party to raise concerns regarding a particular procurement or awarded vendor. The objective of the state procurement process is to facilitate each state agency's mission while protecting the interests of the state and its taxpayers while promoting fairness in the contracting community. It is important that any interested party is provided with an opportunity to raise concerns or protest about the legal and or factual basis of a contract award that is subject to OSC approval. Public contracting entities are encouraged to establish their own protesting procedures. The benefits to establishing these protest procedures and having specific policies outlined in your solicitation documents prior to the release of an advertisement for bid will help streamline the agency's internal processes, allowing for protest determinations to be made without a third party, such as the state comptroller's involvement, or having a say in the final determination of a state agency protest. The protest procedure applies to all contract awards subject to the approval of the Office of the State Comptroller as required or provided by law, resolution or otherwise, including but not limited to the following. Expenditure contracts over $50,000, OGS contracts over $85,000, revenue contracts over $25,000, and any single or sole source procurements. Once an agency has established their own protest procedures and ensures the procedure is outlined in the solicitation document, a protest from an interested party must be filed with the public contracting entity or state agency. The state agency must then review the protest with their legal counsel and establish the outcome of the protesters' claims. There are also two types of protests that may be filed with the Office of the State Comptroller. An appeal of a protest decision made by the public contracting entity or state agency, or a direct protest to the Office of the State Comptroller if the agency does not have their own protest procedures in place. But again, I'd like to stress the importance of a state agency establishing their own protest procedures. The benefits to establishing these procedures and having specific policies outlined in the solicitation documents prior to the release of an advertisement for bid will help streamline the agency's internal processes, allowing for protest determinations to be made without a third party, such as the OSC involvement, and having a final say in that determination of the state agency's protest. Without an agency defined protest process, initial protests must be in writing and filed with OSC's Bureau of Contracts within 10 business days of notice of award or five business days of debriefing, whichever is later, and must be submitted prior to the comptroller's final action or approval of the contract. 
any appeal from an interested party or an agency's protest determination must be filed with the Bureau of Contracts within 10 business days of the public contracting entity's determination. An appeal must be in writing and a copy must be delivered to the public contracting entity or state agency and the successful bidder. If an interested party is not provided with notice of the contract award, they may file a protest with the Bureau of Contracts at any time after the contract award and prior to the comptroller's final action on the contract. Whether or not an appeal is filed with the Bureau of Contracts, as part of OSC's review of the contract award, all information regarding that protest, the agency's documented detailed review and determination of the protest must be submitted to the OSC for review upon submission of the procurement package to OSC. The Bureau of Contracts will review all accusations raised in that protest and the agency's determination prior to the final determination of the award. If a protest has not been resolved, the procurement package should not be submitted to OSC until that procurement is complete. Again, as a reference, additional information regarding a direct protest to the Office of the State Comptroller or an appeal of an agency determination can be found on the New York State Guide to Financial Operations website under Chapter 11, Procurement and Contracts, Section 17 of Protest Procedures. Now we, we will proceed with discussing the submission of the full procurement record to OSC related to procurement to protest and debriefings. An agency procurement is not complete if the agency has not given non-successful bidders 15 calendar days from the notice of non-award letter to request a debriefing. The agency has not given the later of five business days from debriefing or 10 business days from the notice of non-award letter to consider filing a protest. A protest received by the agency or the Bureau of Contracts has not been resolved. An agency should not submit contracts until the procurement is complete, meaning the appropriate timeframes have passed and all debriefing and protest documentation is available upon submission. Additional information regarding additional documentation that is required with the submission of a full procurement record will also be discussed further on in this presentation. Details regarding debriefing and or protest must be provided as part of the complete procurement package when submitting a full procurement record to OSC. All items discussed during the debriefing must be documented in detail for the procurement record. All information regarding protest, the agency's detailed review and determination of the protest must be documented and uploaded upon submission of the procurement record to the comptroller in the electronic document submission system or EDSS. It is important to keep in mind when an agency is uploading a submission of the completed procurement record to OSC, any debriefing and or protest timelines have passed and all protests and appeals where provided for must be resolved prior to submission. Debriefing and protest information must be acknowledged on the procurement record checklist or the memo to OSC as necessary. Please keep in mind, the procurement record checklist should only be signed and dated after the debriefing period has passed. Document appropriately titled debriefing and or protest, along with all supporting documentation, documentation related to such, should also be uploaded in a separate file in the EDSS under supporting documentation. So in closing, the debriefing and protest process ensures that all vendors are treated fairly and that your state agency has a fair, open, and transparent competitive process in place. Up next, Mark is going to discuss some evaluation pitfalls 
to avoid to ensure your state agency will be less likely to receive a protest. Thanks, Jen. Uh, thanks for touching on those uh, concepts behind the protests and debriefings. You know, one of the best ways to actually avoid a procurement protest is to have a well-defined and thought out evaluation plan. So let's take a couple minutes. We're going to run through some case studies of some recent evaluation pitfalls to try and avoid. As we go through the case studies, try and keep section 163.9 of state finance law in the back of your mind, which states that your competitive process should include a clear statement of need, a description of the required specs, a reasonable process for ensuring a competitive field, a fair and equal opportunity for offers to submit responsive offers, and a balanced and fair method of award. Okay, so what does that actually mean? Basically, we're just saying to try and ensure that your process is fair for all participants. Make sure everyone's given the same information and presented with a level playing field. You might even wanna run through your evaluation a couple times with some different scenarios. You can throw in a few different numbers just to make sure you have a clear understanding of how that best price or the best value is actually gonna be determined when you get your bids in. So just think about that as we run through these scenarios. Was the process fair? Was it reasonable for everyone? Does, is the method of award balanced? Maybe you even wanna think about it as what are some of the questions that you might get from OSC? So for case study number one, we're gonna talk about uh, pass fail mandatory requirements. So in this case study, we have three different vendors being evaluated based on two mandatory requirements which are shown as M1 and M2. And the agency's evaluation plan outlined that three evaluators will score the mandatories. Vendor number one was evaluated by the full three-person panel, but the three evaluator scores don't agree with each other. Some had passed the vendor, while others determined the vendor to be non-responsive to those same requirements. Remember, state finance law specifically mentions that evaluation should be based on objective and quantifiable analysis, meaning that the requirements should be clearly measured by a pass-fail evaluation. It shouldn't be left, left up to your evaluators' use of their discretion on if a vendor is qualified to actually perform the work or not. Does the vendor actually have the required certificates they need? Do they have the years of experience that were identified? If you have a requirement that can't clearly be met with a pass-fail rating, it might mean that either that requirement was written too vaguely and the evaluators can't actually agree on who met it, or the requirement was so in-depth that it might be better suited as an area of technical evaluation. So also in this example, vendors two and three were only scored by one evaluator each, and their determination of responsiveness was based on that one decision. So like I mentioned, the requirements should be clearly measured. So typically one evaluator is gonna be sufficient uh, for this type of administration re administrative review section. But the issue again here is that the evaluation plan clearly said that three evaluators would score each vendor. So not only did the agency not follow the written plan, but also the three bidders weren't all treated equally. Vendor number one, again, was evaluated by three evaluators and the other two vendors were each scored by different evaluators each which isn't really a fair and equal process for everybody. So overall, the evaluation methods just seem to be very vague with no real consistency amongst the evaluators. The requirements were probably written so confusing that the evaluators themselves couldn't really agree on who was actually responsive. So take a look for yourself. We'll keep this up on the screen for a second and see if you can identify any other errors or inconsistencies that we might've missed. All right, so we're gonna move on to case study number two here. In this example, the procuring agency couldn't tell who the winner of the procurement was. They requested an hourly labor rate, the estimated number of hours needed to complete the work, and a percent markup on parts. So the final cost considers both the hourly rate and the number of hours, but didn't have a predetermined method to account that percent markup on parts. So upstate plumbing, Certainly looks like they have the lower final cost, but since their parts markup is double that of the other bidder, how can we really be sure who the best cost for the state is? Did the vendors maybe already take that percent markup on parts into account in their cost bid? So these are just some of the important questions that we couldn't answer based on the bid sheet alone. 
So I'll ask you, with the information that's given here to the vendors, who would you actually award a contract to? Or could you even award a contract at all? In the end, we weren't able to determine who actually presented the best cost to the state. So this isn't really to say that you can't evaluate both hourly rates and percentages together under one procurement. The issue here is that there was no real method identified for how to actually take all that into account. So as a best practice, the procuring agency could have identified estimated value of the parts. And if that same estimate was given to all of the vendors, then it would have given a fair and quantifiable, and quantifiable evaluation process. And although it doesn't directly relate to the outcome of the award. Another potential concern here is that both of vendors hourly rates and estimated number of hours were vastly different from one another. Since one vendor proposed almost double the amount of hours to complete the work, we would probably wonder if both vendors had the same understanding on the work that was actually required. Was the scope clear in the solicitation? So a good way to also forecast for something like this would be to complete and document a pre-bid estimate for what you think that job might cost before you actually go out to bid. That way, you'll always have at least one comparable once your bids come in. Um, this is just a good way to also document price reasonableness in case your bids aren't in line with one another, such as this. But again, in this study, even if the agency had done that, even if they were able to justify those hourly rates and the number of hours to be reasonable, we still don't really know how that percent markup comes into play. Because it wasn't predetermined in the procurement, and the agency isn't really sure how that markup is going to affect the overall cost. So again, what we're looking for, like Randy said, is fair, open, was it transparent for everybody? All right, so case study three here, uh, the, procur the procuring agency estimated the job would take a total of 200 hours to complete. So they broke it up into 100 prime contractor hours and 100 subcontractor hours. And the bidders were asked to provide an hourly rate for each of those categories. And these were the two bids that they had received. But the first vendor, Acme Repairs, indicated they don't actually hire subcontractors because they do all the work themselves. So consequently, they left that hourly rate for subcontractors blank to account for it. The second bid from Beta Fix It provided for both a prime hourly rate and a subcontractor hourly rate as the IFB had asked for. So based on this scenario, who do you think should win the award? Again, was this a fair and balanced process for everybody? So even though Acme Repairs seems to have the lowest total cost, they're really only being evaluated on 100 total hours of work. Whereas beta fix it is being evaluated on 200 hours of work, the 100 prime plus the 100 sub hours. So if you now multiply Acme's hourly rate of $90 per hour by the total of 200 total hours, they're no longer the lowest bid because their grand total comes out to 1800. So we just want to note that it's best practice to advise all vendors of the total number of hours to complete the work and let them decide for themselves how they need to distribute that work. If you tell each vendor that the total that the project is estimated to take 200 total hours of work, it leaves them with the flexibility to actually give you an accurate hourly rate. All right, and we have a similar scenario here in case study number four, which the procuring agencies uh, requested an hourly rate for standard time between nine and five and another hourly rate for after hours work. So nine to five heating an hourly rate of zero dollars for the after hours work because they don't anticipate that work actually to be needed. So in this example that we saw, uh, that happened to be the incumbent vendor. So they knew that after hours work was not used in the past. So because they had that inside information that wasn't actually given out in the IFB, they end up with the lowest grant total, even though their standard rate is over double that of the other bid. So this goes back to, like Priscilla mentioned, the importance of having accurate estimates in your solicitation. If the vendors were given the historical usage of the after hours work, the agency would have a better understanding on who actually provides the state with the best price. But because the estimates weren't accurate, the agency was now willing to pay $220 an hour for services that would typically have that cost. So again, was the process fair, open, transparent? Was everybody given the same opportunities? It was a process for selecting a winner predefined before receiving the bids. 
So just keep that in the back of your mind before releasing your next solicitation, and you're going to be one step closer to a successful procurement. So now I'm going to hand it off here to Alyssa uh, to explain what to do in those situations where a competitive process isn't always feasible. Thanks, Mark. So once your agency has determined that none of the other priority procurement methods listed within the procurement guidelines meet your form, function, and utility, your agency may be considering a single or sole source method of procurement. In the next few slides, we are going to go over what a single and sole source is, what kind of information OSC is looking for when considering your request, and what your agency will see when submitting your request to OSC for approval via EDSS. So first, let's start by talking about why a single or sole source exemption is required. Per Article 11 of State Finance Law, all procurements over 50,000 by an agency shall be advertised prior to the award in accordance with Article 4C of the Economic Development Law. Economic Development Law goes on to say that OSC shall not approve any contract over the amount of 50,000 unless notice has been published in the Procurement Opportunities Newsletter for at least 15 business days prior to the bid due date. However, pursuant to Economic Development Law Section 144.1, there are some scenarios in which OSC exempts this requirement. These would be contracts awarded on a critical or emergency basis or in an instance where the publication is not feasible, for example, a single or sole source. In these instances, an agency would need to obtain a contract reporter exemption request from OSC prior to entering into these types of contracts. So before we begin talking about the submission of CRERs to OSC, let's look at the law that governs the requirements related to single and sole source procurement. State Finance Law Section 163.10b states that a single or sole source award may be made without a formal competitive process but shall only be made under unusual circumstances. Also, this section of law states that all state agencies shall minimize the use of a single source procurement and that the agency is required to document why a formal competitive process is not feasible. And lastly, the term of a single source procurement shall also be limited to the minimum period of time to ameliorate the circumstances which created the reason for agency's use of a single source award. The agency is then required to no later than 30 days after the award of the contract, publish notice of the award with a summary of the material and substantial reasons why a competitive procurement was not used. So when OSC is reviewing your agency's single or sole source request, we are looking to ensure that the request fits the requirements as outlined in 163 of state finance law. So what is considered a single or sole source? Per the definitions provided under state finance law, a sole source is when only one offerer is capable of supplying your commodity or service. Overall, there are very few instances when an award is truly a sole source. A single source is when there may be two or more vendors that can supply the required commodities or services, and the agency can provide a material or substantial reason as to why they wish to award to one vendor over the other. When a single source is being used, there are going to be several factors that must be documented, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Now that we have gone over the definitions and laws, let's discuss the submission of the contractor reporter exemption request. Once you have determined your agency's need for a single or sole source procurement, you're going to create a contract reporter exemption request. Your agency is going to do this via EDSS, and once this process has started, you will need to answer various questions to justify your agency's need for a non-competitive procurement based on your type of request, either emergency, single, or sole source. We are going to break down each question and provide a little insight on the things OSC is looking to receive when your agency documents these circumstances. The first question you're going to be asked is to provide a description of goods or services your agency is looking to procure. So this question is asking, what is your agency's need? Is this request for a new contract or a change to an existing contract? If the request is for a change to an existing contract, make sure you provide OSC with that contract number in your request. Another thing to take into consideration is has your agency used these goods or services in the past? If so, how are they procured then? 
If they were previously competitively procured, how many bids were received and why is it now necessary to obtain an exemption instead of doing a competitive procurement again? If these goods or services were previously procured via single or sole source, how long has it been since your agency has looked into the market? There may be new products or services available now that could meet your need. Next, we are going to ask you to document the material and substantial reasons why your agency can't do a formal competitive process. Is there a legislative or executive order that requires your agency to contract with this vendor? OSC is aware of some instances where an agency has to contract with a specific vendor because that vendor has been named in legislation. If this is the case, please be sure to provide a copy of that legislation or executive order with your submission. If the vendor is not specifically named in legislation, we want to know what the unusual circumstances are that resulted in the need for a single source request. Why is it necessary to contract with this specific vendor at this time? Was there, why is their product what is needed to meet your agency's form, function, and utility? We are going to be able to provide a more detailed information on this in the next section of this request, but one example of this might be providing your agency's internet product search efforts. We are ultimately looking for information to support that your agency has done their due diligence and this vendor is the best fit and it's truly just not feasible to advertise. We are going to expand on the previous question as to why a formal competitive process is not feasible. We would also be looking for further justification on the vendor in this section. How is the selection of this vendor fair and equitable? How did your agency determine that no other vendors would be disadvantaged had they not been given the opportunity to bid? Is this product available through a distributorship? There may be instances where a specific product or service is needed, but there may be more than one vendor who is able to supply that product, as there may be different distributorships or third-party resellers who could have bid if the need was advertised. We want to ensure that the agency has exhausted all of those potential avenues prior to entering in to a single or sole source agreement. One of the most important things we are looking for when reviewing a single source request is what alternatives did the agency consider? What research has your agency done to determine what other alternatives, if any, exist out there? Who are those vendors and how do those products differ from the selected vendor an easy way for an agency to display this information in your request is by providing a side-by-side -side comparison of comparable products or services and to identify the features you need that are not provided by other vendors' products. Again, we want to make sure the agency has researched the market and considered all potential vendors and products to ensure a fair procurement and that no other vendors could be potentially disadvantaged. As you remember from a few slides back, State Finance Law 163 requires that a single source request is for the minimum necessary time to ameliorate the circumstances which created the material and substantial reason for the request. So here we would like you to tell us the length of your request and why you need this amount of time. Was there an error or mistake in the new procurement? Is this error or mistake resulting in delays in getting the new contract up and running? How long do you need to bridge that gap and how did your agency determine that amount of time to be reasonable? Was there unforeseen any other unforeseen circumstances? If so, elaborate on what it is and how does that time frame requested help to resolve them? Are there deliverables under an existing contract that still need to be completed? If so, what are they and what is the estimated time for completion? Does the time frame requested reasonably account for future procurement development activities, if any. We want to ensure the time frame requested is reasonable, but also fully accounts for any delays that might occur during the procurement process. For this reason, we want to know, when does your agency expect to complete key procurement activities? For example, tell us the status of the solicitation document. Is it completed or currently being worked on? When do you anticipate the RFP or IFB will be released? When will the bids be due, awards be made, and what is the anticipated contract start date? Also, is there any other details OSC should be aware of that may delay this time frame? Lastly, with the submission of your CRER, OSC will be looking for price justification to ensure the proposed costs are reasonable. Examples of this might be a previous contract, if there was one. How do those proposed costs compare to that agreement? 
If they're higher, how did your agency determine that increase of rate to be reasonable? Does another state agency procure a similar product or service? If so, how do their costs compare? Other examples we often see are comparisons to GSA pricing, manufacturer price lists, or if your agency has received multiple quotes from various vendors. These are all great options for helping to provide price justification. And with that, I will now pass it to Margie and Zach, who will talk to you about your procurement record. Thank you, Alyssa. The procurement record is where the agency goes through the process of solicitation, vendor selection, and determination of how the rates are reasonable. We are here today to share some tips and tricks to make it easy for OSC to agree with you, the agency, and approve your transaction. Our Guide to Financial Operations, Chapter 11, walks us through the steps of how to submit a package, including fund reservation, document preparation in SFS, and it also contains an electronic document submission guide. We have broken the procurement record process down into four categories, transaction identifying documents, contract, procurement record documents, and vendor responsibility documents. We will now look at each of these in more detail. The first category is made up of two important documents. The first one is the procurement record checklist, which you can download directly from the Procurement Council's website or from the OSC's Guide to Financial Operations. The checklist is the first item an auditor will read when beginning the review of your contract. It contains important information, such as the method of award, the vendor selection process, how many bids were received, if any were withdrawn or rejected, and if there were any bid protests, debriefings, or unusual circumstances surrounding this transaction. If there were, it is important you submit any information regarding these adverse circumstances, any correspondence between you and the contractors involved, as well as an explanation as to how the issue was resolved. The second important document is the cover letter. You will use the checklist and the cover letter to tell us your story. Tell us the story your agency went through to complete this procurement. Let the auditor know as many details as you can about how you selected the vendor and how the rates were determined to be reasonable. Summarize the need for the contract. The following items should be mentioned. Contact information. Please provide emails and phone numbers for at least two contacts in EDSS. Sometimes a contact may be on vacation or out of the office unexpectedly. By providing two contacts, it will ensure our communication will be reached by your agency and potentially assist with speeding up the review time. Please indicate if the awarded vendor will be using subcontractors. If so, list the names and estimated values provided for each. Again, tell us your story. Let us know if you had to make any important or unique decisions during the RFP or IFB progression. Let us know how and why the outcome was made. Depending on the number of bids received, you may want to include additional cost justification and explain how the solicitation list was developed. These are just a few common items that tend to be included in a good cover letter to OSC. Please don't limit yourself to these topics and remember to provide us with any significant details surrounding the procurement. Include everything you believe is important. This is helpful for both parties. OSC review will go smoothly 
and you will have your transaction approved more timely. Category two contains the contract, which is also called the agreement. Some important elements to contain are the vendor name, term, and the dollar value established in the agreement. Verify these items are consistent in all the documents submitted and that they match what was entered into SFS. For the pricing section, please be sure to include any escalation, payment terms, and budget. Other important elements include the order of precedence, the most current Appendix A, all appendices, exhibits, and attachments, termination for convenience language, statement of work, and most importantly, the signature page. Let's take a minute to talk about this. Please be sure to have the contract number appear somewhere on the signature page, as well as in the contract. This will help expedite the review process. Make sure the agreement is signed by you, the contractor, and leave a designated space for the OSC approval signature. Also concerning signature, if you have a new person or someone who is new to signing off on contracts, you must make sure they are authorized with OSC to sign the contracts. We have a very quick and streamlined process for this. The contact authorized signature form is in the GFO. You simply download it and fill it out. It is a short, one page document requesting your agency name, business unit, division, and the name and contact information of the person or persons for whom you are requesting authorization. Once the form is complete, you email it back to our administrative assistant, Claudette Hennessy, whose email is on this slide for your reference. This whole process is located in OSC's Guide to Financial Operations. The chapter is also listed on this slide for your future reference. And now, my colleague Zach will share more about the procurement record documents. Thanks, Marjorie. So next we'll discuss the, discuss the third category, procurement record documents. This is considered to be the most broad of all four categories. As you can see, a variety of the documents should be filed within the procurement record category. The category includes advertising documents, which consists of the ad placed in the contract reporter, as well as the solicitation list. Please be sure that the version of the contract reporter ad you provide is either active or has been closed. Please do not provide the version that is pending, as that is not proof that the ad has been posted. Procurement record documents is also the category where you would file the request for proposal or invitation for bids. This should include any attachments, appendices, questions and answers, etc. In the event that this file or any other must be split into two or more due to size, please be sure to name the split file accordingly. For example, RFP part one of two. Next up in this category is the evaluation instrument, encompassing both the blank evaluation tool, as well as the directions provided to all evaluators prior to evaluation of the bids. Then we have the bid tab. Simply put, this is just the document in which one representative from your agency has listed all of the bids received and confirmed that they have been received on time. For an IFB, this should also include the bid price. After that, we have the award document. The award documents include the award letter sent to the awarded vendor, as well as the correspondence sent to all other vendors, informing them that they were not selected for award. If there are rejected bids, please explain why the bid has been rejected within the rejection letter. Post-award documents are next, and that would include any debriefings requested or information about protests if any were received. If a vendor requests a debriefing, please just include a short summary of what was discussed at each debriefing. 
Finally, we have other required forms, and this could include the ST220, B1184, or any other similar documents. The biggest difference in the procurement record document category between a submission for an RFP and an IFB is what is required to be submitted as far as the actual proposals. This table here breaks down what would be needed for each. For an RFP, please provide the technical proposals as well as an administrative proposal if necessary for the awarded vendor and any non-responsive vendor. Please also provide the cost proposals for all bidders. For an IFB, the cost proposal or bid should be submitted for the awarded vendor and any non-responsive bidders. As a side note, please be aware that there are scenarios in which OSC may ask for all of the cost bids. For example, if the bids are particularly close or if a math error is discovered in the awarded vendor's proposal. The final category, vendor responsibility, should include a completed and signed vendor responsibility profile for the prime contractor as well as for any known subcontractor receiving $100 or more. Please also provide a vendor responsibility questionnaire for any transactions at or above $100,000. If the vendor has completed the online questionnaire, there is no need to print and scan that, as we have access to the online database and can see those. Along with the profile and questionnaire, this category can also house the proof of workers' compensation and disability benefits certificates. As you can see here, we have provided a list of all acceptable forms for each. All of the files discussed in the vendor responsibility category should be uploaded as one file, as this allows our vendor responsibility team to easily locate all of the documentation that they will need to review. Finally, we'll wrap things up today with a few quick tips to help create a smoother review process. First, please upload all documents as PDF files. While we understand that there may be some exceptions to this rule, like Excel spreadsheets with built-in formulas, OSC would like to see documents that we are unable to edit. Along with this, please make sure that all PDFs are searchable. If you have any questions regarding this, please don't hesitate to reach out to an OSC auditor. Next, feel free to group like things together. For example, upload all cost proposals into one PDF file, or as previously stated, upload all vendor responsibility documents into one PDF file. Cutting back on the number of files an auditor needs to open can help save time and potentially get that contract or amendment approved quicker. When submitting an amendment, it's not necessary to upload the original contract. In almost all cases, we do have access to the original contracts. Next, when creating PDF files, please focus on the file names. For example, blank RFP or vendor X technical proposal. The more descriptive a file name is, the easier it is for the auditor to locate what they're looking for. Rather than spending time opening the files submitted to find one specific document, that time can be spent reviewing the submission, again, speeding up the review process. On that same note regarding file names, if your agency is uploading an evaluation or proposal document individually for each vendor, please list the vendor's name in the file title. Finally, when responding to correspondence from OSC, please provide your responses through EDSS rather than uploading a separate document. Obviously, if documents have been requested, those should be uploaded separately through the system, but questions should be answered right in EDSS. While these were just a few quick tips, please feel free to reach out to anyone here if you have any questions. We're glad we were able to share this information with everyone today and hope that you were able to take something useful away. Now, if you've submitted a question in the chat, and we are unable to get to it today, or you think of any questions after our presentation has concluded, please feel free to reach out to any of the presenters as we have provided the contact information for each of us here, and this presentation will also be available online for everyone. We've also provided a number of reference documents related to everything discussed today. Please feel free to use the links to assist you going forward once again, we really appreciate everyone who could attend, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks.